the program this afternoon uh, is going to consist, I think, primarily of some personal reflections and observations uh, about which uh, to most of our students is uh, really ancient history and probably to most of our audience is uh, 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 ancient history. So it in some ways was real shocking uh, when we started putting this together. I was just mentioning to uh, uh, Craig Peterson that I was going through some things and um, uh, I was shocked in 1966 that there were still segregated school schools uh, uh, 12 years after the Brown decision, and I think today no one is shocked that there are segregated schools 50 years uh, after the Brown decision. So uh, the, it's been fun for us, I think, to sort of go back and, and reflect upon what the situation was in 1964 to uh, uh, <clears throat> on into the 1970s uh, and uh, uh, put this together. Uh, but I think. Roughly what we're going to do, uh, and there won't be a lot of continuity here, uh, is, is go in uh, chronological order. Uh, uh, Craig Peterson was part of the uh, Freedom Summer in 1964. Uh, Bill Carroll was part of the uh, Selma Movement uh, in 1965, which led to the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and then I was in Mississippi in 1966 for the uh, Meredith March and, and, and working there. Uh, and then Diane Kaplan, who of course came somewhat after us, uh, was involved in a, a number of issues, particularly with uh, Native Americans and uh, uh, the Constitutional Rights uh, uh, Foundation and, and, and groups like that. So we'll start with Professor Peterson. He'll give you a little summary of what he uh, uh, did and, and his observations. Thank you very much. Um, my experience was literally 40 years ago uh, this spring. Uh, I lived and operated out of New Orleans, um, which is, of course, the home of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, and uh, covered southern Mississippi as well as the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. In an event called the uh, Mississippi Freedom Summer, um, thousands of civil rights activists uh, came down, primarily white college students from the north, uh, in that period of time, uh, aimed primarily at voter registration. Various civil rights activist groups had been functioning in Mississippi since about 1961 uh, because only about 6% of the African American uh, eligible voters were registered at that point, uh, the lowest in the nation. And there was an effort uh, made to uh, encourage people to register to vote, especially because the uh, 1964 presidential election was coming up and so forth. So uh, it began in 1961. 64 was the so-called Mississippi Freedom Summer. It was designed to uh, make a cap on that uh, registration effort. The problems in Mississippi were uh, varied. Uh, the principal problems were informal but very significant impediments to registration. Uh, officials, sheriffs, elected officials, um, local people, uh, business people, and so forth, through uh, beatings, lynchings, other kinds of intimidations, firings, discouraged people from registering uh, uh, to vote. There was a sense that if uh, African American uh, registrants could uh, register to vote more effectively, then there would be political change, there would be pressure for uh, better schools, uh, more equality, and, and so forth. The um, group that was uh, our client basically was called the Congress of Federated Organizations. It had a variety of uh, individual and organizational components, including something called CORE, uh, the NAACP, something called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. These are all acronyms that uh, were very, <laughs> very much well known in, in those uh, 40 years ago. Um, basically, the uh, program involved training. Uh, college students from the north, there were several thousand of them trained in Ohio primarily. They then drove down in buses, cars, and other methods uh, in June 1964. Once there, they lived with uh, families throughout the whole state. They uh, were attempting to register uh, people who were not registered to vote, and they also established 30 so-called freedom schools. These were 
uh, summer school activities where uh, good books were available and uh, efforts made to uh, increase self-esteem and quality of education among um, the children in Mississippi, and about 3,000 students uh, participated in that activity. Um, the, there was an anticipation of the need for lawyers and law students because uh, there were going to be threats of, and harassment and difficulties and so forth, uh, with the result that uh, a large number of volunteer lawyers uh, were uh, enlisted to come down for two to three weeks, sometimes longer. Uh, there were professors, there were uh, practitioners and so forth from all over the country that lived in Mississippi. Some of them were down in New Orleans where we were stationed as well. And in addition to that, there were 30, roughly 30 law students from various uh, schools, primarily in the East, uh, who were selected to go down and provide research uh, uh, capability to the efforts uh, in Mississippi, and I pr was one of the 30 people involved uh, there. During the summer, uh, a lot of eventful things happened. The most uh, shocking, I'll mention in a few moments, was the murder, of course, of the three civil rights workers, which occurred uh, physically about, I'm sorry, chronologically about two days before we arrived down there, although at the time that we arrived and driving through Mississippi, they were still missing. There was not, no knowledge that they had been actually murdered. Um, there were uh, more than a thousand arrests of African Americans and also white volunteers uh, during the summer. Uh, there were 80 plus beatings. Uh, there were extensive fire bombings of the Freedom Schools uh, and the homes where the volunteers were living and uh, people who were uh, local people who were at risk primarily uh, for later as well. Um, what kind of work did we do? Um, basically, uh, there were lots and lots of arrests for uh, trumped up charges parading without a permit. That was the uh, principal statutory violation that the local Mississippi sheriffs used uh, against volunteers who went from house to house trying to encourage people to register to vote. That was deemed to be uh, parading uh, without a permit. They would then often be incarcerated in a very dangerous situation where uh, sheriffs and also private persons could potentially uh, harm them. So the effort was made in Mississippi to uh, file habeas corpus petitions immediately uh, in the federal system. The federal judges in Mississippi tended not to uh, grant those habeas corpus petitions, uh, notwithstanding the uh, apparent violation we felt and, and clear violations of uh, civil rights, especially the Equal Protection Clause and also the First Amendment. And the next step would be to appeal, and that was what our New Orleans staff did very actively in the, with the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, to appeal the denial of the habeas corpus petition so we could get some of these folks out of the local jails as fast as we could possibly do. Another activity that uh, took place uh, actively all summer was uh, fact-finding, interviewing people, developing affidavits, uh, showing uh, what was happening to them all the way from beatings to uh, verbal intimidation and harassment uh, to uh, other kinds of misconduct on the part of the local people. We would develop affidavits, and those affidavits were part of a very large class action lawsuit that was in preparation for the whole summer against uh, a wide range of organizations and public officials and private persons uh, in Mississippi alleging a uh, conspiracy to violate uh, civil rights. Very quickly, um, the uh, group was called the Law Student Civil Rights Research Council. Um, it was organized primarily by Liz Holtzman, who uh, later became a congressman in Manhattan. Um, I and a colleague drove down uh, in a vehicle that was uh, deliberately with southern license plates. Um, we drove across the Mississippi border to the north, and literally 50 feet into the uh, Mississippi border were uh, many, many deputy sheriffs with shotguns, uh, rifles, paddy wagons. It was a very, very intimidating sight. The uh, COFO workers, the, the people who were going to do the registration, had not yet arrived, but obviously the staff was getting ready for them. At that point, uh, the three civil rights workers had been disappeared, uh, and we drove through the whole state uh, during the during the daytime deliberately so that uh, to minimize the the risk. 
Um, the real people who are heroes for all of this uh, summer activity were the locals who had to uh, risk life and limb and, and uh, so forth for that summer and lived down there for the rest of the time. Uh, the second heroes were the people who actually lived day to day for the entire session of the summer. Uh, these were the local, uh, excuse me, the uh, students, college students from the north. They were at great risk. And uh, we think that we as lawyers and law students were helpful in the process, but, but certainly uh, uh, did not have the same levels of, of risk that, um, that those folks were facing. So all in all, um, we, we got many people out of jail. Um, three people died. Um, and uh, it, was a, it was a pretty heady experience for someone who was 22 years old 40 years ago. Thank you. Okay. Bill, do you want to? Uh, <clears throat> Um, I, my involvement at that time was, uh, was not with the law because at that time I was not involved with the law. <clears throat> uh, I was um, involved in the, uh, the civil disobedience aspect of uh, the attempts that were made uh, during that period of time to um, uh, sort of raise consciousness. Um, one of the uh, things that we're, I was confronted at that time since in the area in which I was teaching uh, was the propriety or morality or ethics of uh, disobeying the law. And so uh, what I first would like to do would be to um, <clears throat> uh, just sort of reflect on what uh, f philosophers of the law have, have thought about grounds for, uh, for noncompliance uh, with the law. Uh, they've, uh, there's, there's an old saying that a, a non, I mean, uh, <clears throat> not an old saying, but a, sort of a maxim among philosophers of the law, anyhow, that an unjust law is not a law. And of course, that would allow then for, for disobeying some kind of uh, command which in fact does not have the force of law. The problem with that, of course, is who gets to say whether or not the, the law is just or unjust. And especially at this period of time, there were an awful lot of people, uh, at least in the South, who thought that um, um, Prohibiting a, a black person from drinking from certain water fountains uh, was was a, a just law, and generally segregation has is thought to be in the minds of many people uh, a very good law, a just law. But there are those who took a, take exception to that, and of course this is what gave rise to a lot of the civil disobedience. <clears throat> uh, there's another um, maxim of the law: uh, chessons finis legis, lex. Too. When the purpose, when the purpose of the law, when the purpose of the law uh, ceases, then the law itself is no longer uh, uh, to be to be recognized. <clears throat> uh, for instance, uh, that one time flying over populated areas was viewed as against the law. Uh, nowadays, we have these jets flying over us all the time uh, because things have changed. That is, the technology has changed, and so on. And consequently, the law. Uh, does no longer serve the social purpose for which it was originally articulated. <clears throat> and then there were, Aristotle had the notion of the epi echaia, which is the notion that um, legislators, uh, when they make laws, they, uh, uh, they make them, uh, the medieval philosophers use the term, in pluribus, they make the laws uh, to cover most situations that they can anticipate at that time. Uh, but si situations do arise uh, which uh, can be viewed as not having been anticipated by the legislature, and consequently then, at that, at that time, the individual has to make the decision uh, what the legislature would probably do, what would be reasonable. As a matter of fact, the, the Greek term means the reasonableness of the decision at this time. Uh, that is, uh, this was a situation which the legislature has not had an opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to reflect upon adequately, and consequently now you're up to, it's up to you to make that decision. It doesn't mean that pe everyone's going to agree with you, uh, but uh, talking about the morality or ethics of your behavior, uh, this seems to be justified at, um, if you make that kind of decision on the basis uh, that this is what's necessary. Now, one aspect of that is really the, what's come to be known as the necessity defense. <laughs> Uh, which says that one ought to break a law, one ought to not literally comply with a law, uh, if to do so is going to cause a greater harm uh, than breaking the law would, uh, would, would prevent. And so the, you know, the classical example of the person who's rushing to the hospital with someone who is um, 
and needs medical attention uh, immediately or, or he's going to die. And therefore, uh, driving beyond the speed limit is, uh, is justified under in, in that view. <clears throat> now, this, the, this particular position was articulated in a, um, uh, a pens by a Pennsylvania appellate court in a particular case where a number of people had broken into a, uh, a place where they were making uh, nuclear missiles or preparing aspects of it anyhow. And uh, they broke in there and they did a little uh, uh, damage, uh, so pretty superficial damage. Uh, but at the time that they were charged then with, with trespassing, uh, they, were, um, uh, they, they had attempted at the trial level to raise the uh, defense of necessity to argue that uh, what they were doing was attempting to avoid um, the, uh, the evil that can result from uh, nuclear warfare. Uh, the court at that time gave this one of the concurring opinions uh, was this. Uh, there are higher values than the value of literal compliance with the law. As soon as we acknowledge this fact, we recognize that justification that the, the justification defense is essential to the rationality and justice of all penal provisions. What value higher than the value of literal compliance with the law are these defendants asserting? They are pleading the danger arising from nuclear missiles. One who does not understand that danger does not understand the appellant's plea. Appellants do not assert that their action would avoid nuclear war. Their belief was that their action in combination with the actions of others might accelerate a political process, ultimately leading to the abandonment of nuclear missiles. And that belief should not be dismissed as unreasonable as a matter of law. And so the Pennsylvania court ruled uh, that they should be allowed to raise that, um, that defense. Uh, basically what the, what the court is saying, or at least its concurring opinion is saying, <clears throat> is that um, uh, actions which themselves are not going to really affect very much, and on this particular occasion, but they may make their contribution toward a gradual uh, raising of consciousness about the propriety of certain, uh, certain laws. And this may justify, therefore, the uh, the breaking of the law in order to um, to push put forward push forward uh, this uh, this gradual development. And hopefully, although we as it was just pointed out by Professor uh, our colleague here, that the um, uh, the um, separation uh, that uh, the segregation that was uh, uh, a thought successfully attacked way back in <clears throat> in um, a long time ago. Uh, in fact, continues today. But gradually, there has been a change in, in mentality. Now, given that particular view, uh, what had happened in my particular experience uh, was that um, I had um, had access to an aircraft. Uh, I was teaching in, in Pennsylvania at that time at Pittsburgh, and I had access to an aircraft. And after Bloody Sunday uh, down in Selma, uh, this was long before, this, not long before, but significantly before the famous Selma March, uh, but the uh, Martin Luther King and the uh, SCLC was attempting to uh, uh, form a march that would begin in Selma, cross over the Alabama River, then make its way 50 miles to the uh, to the state capitol uh, to protest a recent killing of a fellow by the name of Lee Jackson, Jamie Lee Jackson, uh, who had been involved in some of the activities already been described, and secondly to protest the. Um, uh, the exclusion from really uh, the exercise of their rights to vote. <clears throat> uh, what had happened on that particular day, if any of you, I don't know if anybody of you remember at that time, uh, but um, uh, there was an attempt to cross the bridge over the Alabama River, and uh, the, uh, the deputy sheriffs and um, the, the local state police and so on had uh, resisted <coughs> this by use of dogs and by beatings and so on. And um, I was sort of upset about that. So I had, as I said, access to an aircraft. I happened to be a pilot at the time. And uh, I flew down to Selma to be there to, to, uh, to uh, see what I could contribute to and was there for a few days during which time uh, I was in the attempts to cross the bridge and exposed to some of that uh, kind of behavior and the man behind me was killed. Uh, but what happened at that point um, was... Um, uh, an interesting development in um, the civil rights movement. Um, in 1964, um, uh, I mean, 1960, yeah, 1964, Stokely Carmichael uh, had just graduated from um, 
uh, from college, and he had been made the chairman of SNCC, FSNC, the Student Nonviolent non uh, Coordinating Committee. Um, but that was at a, at a time when what had been developing ever since 1960. See, in 1950, uh, Martin Luther King himself had been again already in, involved in civil rights disobedience, I mean civil disobedience uh, in these sit-ins and so on. And in the 60s, uh, the famous Greensboro group that uh, was involved in, in sit-ins, in that particular year, the end of 1960, already f about 50,000 had been involved in, in uh, these sit-in demonstrations and so on, <clears throat> where they were sitting into areas uh, where the um, uh, where it was uh, where whites only were allowed to sit in these various restaurants and so on. And this was sort of copying some of the things that Martin Luther King had done. But by 1964, uh, there was some of the younger members of, of SNCC were beginning to think that uh, <clears throat> while all of this was uh, uh, was interesting and so on, that uh, that maybe something much more uh, aggressive must be done in order to bring to the attention of the American public um, the uh, the conditions of uh, certain areas of our society, groups of our society, we're uh, undergoing, and. Um, as a result, uh, after some of these these days uh, trying to get over the Alabama River, uh, the members, some members of the SNCC organization, <clears throat> uh, myself discussing with him, uh, we used to sit on the on the uh, the steps of the uh, what's called the Brown Chapel. That's where the group would meet. At that time, there were only about there were only a few hundred people down there uh, at this particular moment in Selma, and. Um, uh, there was a strong uh, feeling among some members of SNCC uh, that we ought to become much more aggressive, uh, that this uh, we weren't getting the attention of anybody and so on, and things weren't working out so effectively for the, uh, for the objective. Uh, but that was, and, and, uh, and, and, and Martin, Martin Luther King was arguing against that, but the, um, there were some very uh, strong members of, uh, of SNCC who were beginning to think in a different kind of way. But anyhow, uh, there um, the thought was that uh, we're never going to going to get across that bridge, and we're just all we're doing is we're getting beaten up each time we try it. Uh, so the idea came: why don't we leapfrog over uh, these th this army of uh, of legal personnel and go directly to the state capitol um, and show just show up there? And so I flew back to uh, up north, back to to Pennsylvania, and organized. Um, uh, some SNCC members there, and when word got out to uh, a number of the universities in that uh, northeast area, some up in New York and <clears throat> so on, some Ohio and the University of Michigan was involved a bit too. <clears throat> and so what we we organized a, um, a, a, a caravan of um, of, uh, of buses and uh, uh, drove down uh, to. Um, uh, directly to to Montgomery, which is the state capital, and where's the which was the objective, of course, of the of the eventually of what came to be known as the Selma March, and uh, we arrived there at nighttime. We had a little trouble getting through Birmingham, but we arrived there at nighttime, and we um, uh, stayed overnight in some of the churches, the black churches there, and stayed in the black community. The next day, we we uh, uh, we formulated our march and we, we made our march and we, as we approached the state capitol, this, the, the pictures over there on the uh, uh, on that, that uh, stand over there are illustrations of what happened on that particular day. But we got as far as the, uh, the state capitol, to just sort of beyond the, uh, and, and beyond the Dexter Street uh, church, by the way, where Martin Luther King was the, um, had been the pastor there. And as we were approaching then the capitol a little bit further, uh, suddenly, from behind the Capitol came uh, a whole um, uh, troop of, uh, of of cavalry. Uh, there were a bunch of uh, uh, we referred to them as rednecks, and, uh, but deputy sheriffs uh, who were on horseback and all had clubs of one sort or another, and they all lined up across uh, from us. And um, uh, the order, of course, was for us to disband and and to to, to leave. Uh, while we were uh, discussing what we were going to do, uh, at that point, one of the people, a fellow by the name of Jim Foreman, uh, who was one of the more uh, radical thinking of the, of the group, uh, but really reflecting the ideas of, of many of the people in SNCC by this time, uh, he very purposely dashed across the street against the, the command of the, uh, the local gendarmes, 
and at that point the um, uh, the cavalry uh, attacked all the uh, the students, and uh, as we we ran back trying to withdraw from uh, the encounter, we tried to pull back into the uh, the black community where we thought we might be safe, uh, but the horses continued and they beat the kids up pretty badly. Um, you'll see some of the pictures there. I'm I'm leaning over one fellow there, trying to see whether or not his his he was broke his back was broken, but. Um, uh, so we, we gathered back in the, uh, in the in the black community, and at this point, it became uh, very questionable what was going to happen again because uh, the more radical of the of the group uh, were arguing now very strongly, and we stood. On, I was on one car, and, and he, the other guy was on the other car, and we were arguing back and forth about the uh, what we were going to do at this point, and it became pretty. Uh, uh, clear that uh, in order to keep this thing from going much further, uh, we, we had to quiet things down. So uh, we called for Martin Luther King, who at that time had gone down to, um, to Mobile, Alabama, from Selma. He had gone down to Mobile, and we got in touch with him and got him to come on back. And we had a meeting in a motel uh, that night, sort of a war meeting. And uh, at that point, it became very questionable what was going to happen the next day. I was very concerned because I felt now responsible uh, for all these students I had brought down there, and, and many of them were, were quite injured and so on. And I was wondering what was going to happen the next day. But luckily, the next, what had happened that night, apparently, is the um, television, during, I mean, during that day, the television, uh, some television crews were on hand, and they had televised what had happened uh, uh, during the day in, uh, there in Montgomery, and that was shown that evening across the country. Um, and uh, the, as a result, there was sort of outrage all across the country. And the next morning, uh, we discovered that uh, the federal judge now ordered that the um, state of Alabama had to uh, allow the march to go forward from Selma to, to Montgomery uh, with protection, but with police protection. And as a result of that, the uh, the famous Selma March was uh, was then allowed to, uh, to go forward uh, with the protection of the uh, people and uh, with protection of the uh, of the of the uh, the police of Alabama, state police of Alabama. And uh, as a result of that, it's, it's 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 often said that that is what made possibly the the Voting Rights uh, that uh, was that Voting Right Act that I think uh, passed in August of that year. This occurred in. All of this occurred in March. It actually was within about three weeks, all of these things. I went down, I think, on March, maybe March 8th. March 7th was Bloody Sunday. I think I was flew down on March 8th. Uh, and March 15th, uh, I think it was 15th, uh, President Johnson uh, made some statement in favor of the, uh, of the uh, Voting Rights uh, Act. And, um, uh, and then the next day is when we had this, this uh, episode there. And, in front of the state capitol, uh, and uh, the day after that, uh, the uh, federal judge entered the order requiring the uh, police protection for the march that eventually went from Selma to to uh, to Montgomery. But um, uh, and then the very next year, you see things have been happening from from 1960 on. 1960, there had been a lot of hope that a lot of this uh, the civil disobedience, simply of um, well, civil disobedience, these sit-ins and so on. Uh, would be would be effective, but there among the uh, the younger members um, of, of SNCC, there began uh, the belief that uh, that's not the way history shows things to be. I mean, there's are these there are these heroic people who undergo you know, nonviolent, um, I mean, and and, and entertain nonviolent uh, 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 protests and so on. Uh, but that, in fact, things don't really change, uh, and the law doesn't change, and people until people really get. Uh, very much upset about things. And the only way to upset people, the same kind of thinking is going on in Iraq right now, the only way you get people upset, the only people, you get people to a point where they're willing to make concessions because they see the alternative is too frightening, uh, is in fact to, to cause violence. And so some people, and this was a big debate that was going on from 1960 until 1965. In 1966, the Black Panthers uh, organized in Oakland, California. And in 1968, uh, uh, Martin Luther King was uh, was assassinated. Uh, but there was uh, a real change that was taking um, taking place. A feeling that somehow or another the the illegal legal, legal actions that were being taken and attempted and so on to achieve these uh, objectives of freedom and so on <clears throat> uh, were not being successful, and that um, that what we really have to do is throw the bomb. And um, 
whether or not uh, that was, uh, I mean, their the beliefs were supported by what happened on, on March 15th or 16th there. I don't know, but anyhow, that uh, was my experience with, uh, with that particular period of time. Subsequently, I studied law. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to make a, a few reflections on my trip to Mississippi in uh, 1966. In 1966, in many ways, brought to a head uh, the debate between nonviolence and, and, and violence, and, and so it was, a, in some ways, a very, very disturbing time to be uh, in a place like Mississippi. Uh, like Craig, uh, a few days before I left for Mississippi, and I might mention that I was, uh, had finished my second year of law school, uh, was about, uh, uh, again, 21, 22 years uh, old, uh, and um, my parents were not exactly happy that I had decided to go down there, so there was a lot of pressure on me. Uh, not to go down, uh, but a couple of days before I went, uh, James Meredith had started a march uh, at the northern Mississippi border. He was going to walk all the way through Mississippi again to uh, protest segregation and, and, and what was going on there. Uh, just a, a few miles south of the uh, Tennessee border, uh, he was uh, shot. He was not killed, but he was uh, injured. Uh, and there was a big debate, should the march go on? And Martin Luther King and, and all the other uh, groups uh, met and decided uh, that the march would continue. So during the summer of Mississippi, uh, of 66, uh, th this march continued from the northern border uh, and culminated towards the end of the summer then in, in, in Jackson uh, with a, a big uh, a rally. Uh, I went to Mississippi again with, uh, through the sponsorship of the Law Student Civil Rights Research Council. Uh, they paid my uh, airfare to go down there from Moline, Illinois to Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and I also got $15 a week uh, to live on uh, and did so reasonably comfortable. But uh, again, the, the times were a bit different uh, uh, that uh, 38 uh, years ago. Uh, but I primarily went south again uh, at the urgings of one of my professors at the Notre Dame Law School. He had been in Mississippi the summer before, and I had talked to him and became intrigued on that. So four of us went south, four law students from Notre Dame went south that summer, uh, and two of us uh, went to um, uh, Mississippi. Uh, I uh, uh, went to the, um, uh, worked with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund uh, in Jackson, uh, my uh, superiors uh, were t two young attorneys who had just recently graduated from uh, the uh, Yale Law School, one of whom was Marion Wright, now known as Marion Wright Edelman, head of the Children's uh, Defense Fund, uh, and Henry Aronson, who was a, 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 another uh, young attorney who was down there. And there were probably about uh, 10 or 12 of, 12 of us who worked with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund uh, others worked for the Lawyers <clears throat> Committee and, and other groups uh, in Mississippi. My first big assignment, at least away from Jackson, was to go, I was sent uh, and with two other law students to Ruleville, uh, Mississippi, uh, which was in the center of Sunflower County, which was Senator Eastland's county. You may not know about Senator Eastland, but he was sort of controlled the Senate uh, in those days and, and blocked uh, a lot of civil rights uh, legislation. Ruleville was the home of Fanny Lou Hamer, uh, who had uh, conducted demonstrations in Mississippi uh, in 1963 in the town of Winona, just a few miles from Ruleville. She had been severely beaten and uh, was crippled the rest of her life. So we met with uh, 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 Fanny Lou uh, Hamer, and she said, well, tomorrow you're going to go into Drew. And Drew was a small town just north of uh, uh, Ruleville. And she said, no civil rights workers have ever gone into Drew before, so you're going to be the first three law students to go in there. We want to find out what's going on in the schools. Uh, again, 12 years after Brown, uh, the schools were completely segregated. We'd like you to talk to some of the black families there and find out what's happening. Uh, one of the things that was arranged that we were to make a phone call back to the Jackson office every hour uh, to be sure that we were 
uh, okay if they didn't get the phone call. Uh, uh, we were told they'd call in the FBI, although what we know about the FBI now, that probably would not have been uh, a necessarily a safe uh, a proposition. Uh, I might mention that the, while this was early June, the temperatures were well above 100 degrees and the humidity was uh, uh, equal to that. Uh, and we walked around the town uh, interviewing black families. And what was amazing to me is the uh, black families were willing to talk to us. I, I'm not sure why they were. Uh, I certainly, uh, if I had been in their uh, situation, would not have been uh, willing to do that. We were followed a block by about a block behind us by a squad car. Uh, I don't think that was for our protection, uh, but uh, we, we did that. I remember one of uh, the schools there were under freedom of choice, uh, which was a uh, way that was devised somewhat uh, through the um, uh, federal government. Uh, each year, children were sent a choice form uh, to uh, send home uh, as to what school they wanted to go to. Uh, in uh, Drew, as in most of Mississippi, every black student uh, uh, sent the form back saying they wanted to go to the black school. Uh, the reason was that, and it was very apparent in rule, those who did not do that were visited that evening by the principal, said, I think you made a mistake. Uh, if they said, no, we didn't, uh, they would be visited later that uh, evening and probably had their house burned down or worse. Uh, and uh, most of the people were tenant farmers and were uh, uh, e evicted from uh, their stand. I remember talking to one family uh, with 10 children, uh, and their oldest daughter was absolutely brilliant, wanted to go to college, and really wanted to go to the white school. And I remember them talking to us, you know, dare we exercise our freedom of choice and send our children to the, uh, to the white school, and, uh, you know, what do you tell somebody in, in that type of uh, uh, situation? Uh, that evening, uh, we went with uh, so several uh, uh, other uh, civil rights workers to Greenwood, Mississippi. Uh, and the march uh, had made it all the way to Greenwood. And unbeknownst to me and to the rest of us, that afternoon, Stokely Carmichael, who uh, Bill mentioned, had been arrested uh, in Greenwood. Uh, and he got released, and he got up, uh, there was a, hundreds and maybe thousands of people in, in a kind of a, a pasture, just outside of uh, a Greenwood, uh, Stokely got up on a, uh, a little wagon uh, and gave a very fiery speech saying that this was the last time he was going to be arrested and every sentence ended, uh, we want black power. Uh, and uh, that was the uh, origin of the black power slogan and the, and the black power uh, a movement. Uh, and I can only say being there as a white middle-class college student, uh, that having spent the afternoon and the morning uh, talking to uh, sort of plantation uh, workers who were under harassment and scared, and then to go to this rally and hear Stokely, Stokely Carmichael talk about black power, uh, that um, sort of my world was shattered. I, I wasn't quite sure where we were at uh, and didn't have real good feelings as to where the uh, United States uh, was heading. I remember after that uh, uh, encounter, uh, we were standing again sort of at the edge of the pasture talking to uh, an elderly black man and woman. Uh, and they were in a literacy school. They both must have been, it looked to me at that time, of course I was in my 20s, like they were in their 80s. Uh, and uh, they were going to a school to learn how to read and write uh, because they wanted to vote in the next uh, presidential election. Uh, and so they were learning to read and write, write to, to vote. Uh, and I have to admit, every time I go to vote now and when I hear young people saying, you know, there's no point in voting, I think back to that couple who were so excited about learning to read and write so that they could uh, uh, vote. It, it's something that never uh, uh, left me. Uh, after that, uh, I got my permanent assignment. Uh, and much to my horror, I was sent to Clarksdale, Mississippi, which was in the midst of the Mississippi Delta. I was sent there alone, so I went there on a bus all through all of these towns that uh, you had been in the news and stuff about beatings and things like that. I went there alone for the uh, entire summer. I was very, very lucky uh, because 
Clarksdale was the home of Aaron Henry, who was the uh, president of the Mississippi NAACP. Uh, and the NAACP uh, was not part of the uh, radical group, it, it, uh, similar to Martin Luther King, uh, although there were differences between the NAACP and the uh, 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 Southern Christian Leadership Council. And I think that's one of the things that we forget today you think of the civil rights group movement as a monolithic group, and each one of these uh, groups had their own little turf and were fighting among themselves as to what the proper uh, way to uh, achieve justice was. But uh, Aaron Henry was a druggist there, uh, uh, and uh, uh, his drug store became a, sort of a hangout, uh, and it, it was a, a, a very interesting possibility uh, to work there. Two items uh, that I worked on. Uh, one was school desegregation. Again, 12 years after Brown, uh, Clarksdale in Cahoma County decided, you know, it would be real nice if we complied with Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, and we're going to make our schools equal. We're not going to desegregate, uh, but we're going to make our schools equal. They were about 12 years behind the time, uh, but uh, what they did, they were quickly building new black schools, uh, uh, and, and trying to equalize things. They, of course, didn't happen, but surface-wide, uh, uh, that's what they uh, uh, were uh, uh, doing. So a lot of new buildings and things like that uh, were going on. On the other hand, uh, for instance, in, in uh, Clarksdale, uh, there was a white superintendent uh, and a black assistant as superintendent. The white superintendent had jurisdiction over everything. Uh, the black assistant superintendent only over uh, the black schools. Now, the way school uh, segregation was dealt with was very different in Clarksdale than it was in Cahoma County. Uh, in Clarksdale, uh, Clarksdale, again, was uh, part of the Mississippi Delta, a very poor region, many, many poor, uh, illiterate uh, black plantation workers. Clarksdale uh, was in the Cotton area. It was not settled until after the Civil War. Uh, but uh, these huge plantations uh, and uh, then uh, and some very, very wealthy people who had northern ties and educated their children at uh, northern universities and all of that. And then, uh, uh, again, a, a great poverty down there. In Clarksdale, which was a town of maybe about 20 or 30,000, uh, the town was separated by railroad tracks. Uh, and prior to the summer of 1966, uh, a number of black families lived north of the track, so that was primarily white, and there were about 80 black uh, white children who uh, lived south of the tracks. Uh, and uh, the people of Clarksdale, I guess, had looked at Chicago and other places, uh, and they decided, well, the perfect way to solve uh, se uh, segregation is we're going to condemn all the homes of the white families who live north of the tracks, move them to the south side of the tracks. Uh, at the time I was there, we weren't quite sure what they were going to do with the white families. They were mostly very poor whites who lived south of the tracks. Uh, whether they were going to move them to the north side of the town, whether they were going to somehow create a little district uh, down there for them, or whether they might be sacrificial victims and, uh, so that the city could say that some of our schools are really uh, uh, integrated. Uh, but uh, one thing that had happened the year before that, uh, Students were allowed to transfer out of their district if uh, there were courses that were not available in their school. Two very, very bright young black women said they wanted to take Latin. Latin was offered in the white high school. It was not offered in the black school. And their request came the last minute. There was a panic. Uh, but they were allowed to attend the white school. And what was really shocking about that, and what I think really changed things uh, in the South, uh, at least in Clarksdale, was uh, that no black person had ever been in the white schools before. And these girls came home and started talking about what was going on in the white schools. The black teachers, who didn't even know who the white teachers were, things were that s separate, uh, were absolutely shocked. The parents were shocked about uh, the learning advantages uh, in the white schools. And I think more than anything else uh, that galvanized people to push uh, for uh, 
uh, an end to uh, uh, segregation. Uh, the upshot of that, and I'm not sure what the end, end of it was, uh, they, during the summer of that year, the school board was anxiously looking around for a, Latin, a black Latin teacher. Of course, the white Latin teacher could not go to the black schools, so they were looking around for a black Latin teacher. Uh, the the uh, rumor was when I left uh, that they couldn't find one, uh, and therefore they probably were not going to offer Latin in the white school uh, this year either, so that no one, no black student would have an excuse to uh, a transfer uh, schools. Now, in the county, uh, it was, again, under the Freedom of Choice Plan. Uh, and again, out of 5,600 students in the county, only two black students had ever requested to go to the white school, uh, and they were uh, discouraged uh, from that. Uh, the county school board handled both the white schools and the black schools and the white high school, not the black high school. And again, the way uh, 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 education existed in the county was through busing. Students were bused to uh, the, um, not to the nearest school, uh, but to the school uh, of their uh, race. Now, the third school district within that county uh, was the Agricultural High School uh, and the Junior College. Uh, and both of those were black. Uh, and again, the comparison between the facilities in the white high school and the black high school, and I documented all of that through interviews and all of that, uh, were simply uh, appalling. Uh, just uh, two years after I was in Mississippi, uh, the Supreme Court finally, and some of the evidence, again, involved the Clarksdale School District, uh, finally held the freedom of choice system uh, unconstitutional. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, progress was made, but slowly. The other important thing uh, uh, about what I worked on that summer was, uh, I think, fairly unique, uh, is the summer of 1966 uh, in Mississippi, the welfare rights movement was uh, born. Up until 1966, no one outside the welfare department knew what the welfare rules were. And people applied for welfare, and they either were denied or accepted, mostly denied. Nobody knew what the rules was. Nobody knew that they could get hearings, uh, anything uh, like that. So at the beginning of the summer, all the law students met at uh, Mount uh, Beulah, which was a camp uh, just um, outside of uh, uh, Jackson. We got clandestinely a copy of the Mississippi Welfare Rights Manual. Uh, we all pretty much memorized it. Uh, we strategized on how to get hearings for people. Uh, and so part of my work was to interview people uh, see whether they qualified for welfare in Mississippi uh, and get them to request hearings. And our strategy was if we got enough people enough to request hearings and no hearing had ever been held in Mississippi, that the whole system uh, would collapse. But again, for welfare, uh, you couldn't get welfare if there was a man in the house. So if you were poor, the husband had to leave uh, the house. And then they had midnight raids. Uh, so that uh, welfare workers would search the bedrooms of pe welfare recipients uh, after dark to make sure that there wasn't a man in the house. Uh, uh, there, uh, if a neighbor complained that somebody was on welfare and wasn't qualified, they were summarily uh, turned off. No hearings. Uh, again, only nice, good people uh, were allowed to uh, get uh, a welfare. I might mention that right after I was down there uh, the, the next uh, spring, uh, Bobby Kennedy uh, visited the Delta uh, and was appalled. Bobby Kennedy, of course, was the Attorney General under um, uh, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and he was appalled that in the United States there were children that were malnourished. And that made uh, newspaper uh, headlines uh, and uh, uh, really, again, led to the war on poverty uh, and uh, 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 to, uh, uh, as I say, the, the welfare rights uh, uh, movement. Uh, another end result of the uh, uh, Kennedy visit was that uh, his aide was Peter Edelman, who's now a professor at Georgetown, and he met uh, Marion Wright, uh, and uh, they became a couple and uh, uh, were married, and so uh, romances were sparked in Mississippi uh, uh, also. Just a couple things, and then I'll turn it over to uh, 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 Diane. Uh, 
the welfare paid $50 a month for those who could uh, get on it. Uh, and I was going through my notes of people I had uh, interviewed. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, if you were lucky, if you got uh, the, the $50 uh, a month, the normal job for black people down there was seasonal, and that was chopping cotton. Uh, and that paid $3 a day. Uh, and when the chopping season was on, welfare checks stopped. No one could get welfare. They were supposed to go out and work in the fields. And that was, believe me, Mississippi is not a pleasant place in the summer. And being in the hot cotton field, I don't know how anybody could, could last. Uh, but uh, another person I talked to, a maid who worked in a hotel. She had seven children. Uh, she got $21 a week uh, for working, uh, being a maid in the hotel. Uh, her husband was a plasterer. Uh, he got, had one of the best jobs uh, down there. It was paid $85 a week. Uh, he had to, pay, however, most of his work was out of town. He had to pay $25 for lodging uh, a week when he was out of town. Uh, but they were uh, probably among the best well-off uh, people that I uh, met to in town. They were in town. They were buying their own home uh, and that type of thing. Uh, school lunches were 20 cents a day. Every child had to go to the cafeteria, but only probably about one out of five could afford to eat. So the rest of the students had to sit there and watch while the uh, other children uh, ate. Uh, it was um, a very strange thing. I also remember talking to one farmer who owned his land. He owned 40 acres. But he was surrounded by a plantation, and, and one of the largest plantations. They wanted his land. Every day, they drove their heavy equipment across his farm, through his fields, and destroyed his crops. At the end of the summer, he had decided he would sell uh, his land, even though it had been in his family for, 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 for generations. He could not get a lawyer to represent him. I was a law student. I couldn't, of course. Uh, there were, incidentally, two black lawyer, three black lawyers, because Marion Wright passed the bar that year, three black lawyers in the whole state of uh, Mississippi. What did I get out of it? Uh, it was a scary summer. Uh, and uh, I remember, again, when we were in Drew, uh, driving down the highway, flat highway, late at night, seeing a car in the distance, their headlights gaining on us. And I had seen too many, heard too many stories, and my imagination took flight. Uh, it, uh, it was a scary summer. Uh, but more than scary, I think it was shocking. I was a kid who grew up on a farm in Iowa. I had really hardly ever been out of Iowa, been to Notre Dame, which is not really a terribly shocking place. Uh, and uh, it was a shocking experience. I, I, I have to admit I never got over it. It, it, it changed my, my whole life. It changed my whole outlook. Uh, after that, um, I took a job in a large firm in Chicago. Uh, I couldn't get it out of my blood. So went down to Cairo, Illinois, and spent four years there. And on the table, there's uh, an article that I wrote about my experiences in Cairo. But uh, uh, it's uh, not something that I would easily recommend to somebody to repeat this type of an experience. But uh, uh, I think uh, these types of experiences, you don't live through them without, especially when you're at that age, without having a, a, a big change in your life. I suppose by the time I got involved in any of this welfare and civil rights work, you could characterize the journey from outlaw to in-law or from anarchist to institutionalization because things certainly did change by the time I started doing legal work in these areas. Um, the primary area that I worked within the system uh, to effect was in the area of, of health and mental health law. And I did this in two contexts. One was on the Navajo Reservation, and one was at uh, a public interest law firm in Washington, D.C., which was itself um, one of the byproducts of the civil rights movement. Uh, Fifteen years earlier, there was no institution that recognized or dealt with on a regular basis, on an in-house basis, civil rights issues. But by the time I came into that kind of activity, 
law firms had departmentalized pro bono programs. Um, foundations had started to fund public interest uh, law firms and forums to litigate law reform issues. Uh, and then there was the Southern Poverty Law Center, which was an entire litigation engine for law reform. So one of the first places where I started doing health and mental health law was at a, uh, a law firm in uh, the District of Columbia called the Center for Law and Social Policy. And there we, uh, we worked on, well, while I was there, I worked on, the first case I worked on was done in an alliance between Arnold and Porter that had an in-house pro bono program, the Southern Poverty Law Center from Georgia, and the Center for Law and Social Policy. And it was um, considered a civil rights slash welfare uh, type of case. Uh, there were, it was, the case was brought in the name of two very young black girls Katie and Minnie Ralph. One was 19, one was 12. And as part of the family planning program that Georgia was um, implementing through its welfare services, they had both been sterilized without their consent or knowledge. So an action was brought in their name uh, against what was then called HEW, remember HEW, um, Health and what was it? Ed Health Education Health Welfare, Welfare Department, um, in order to get them to change the regulations that permitted states to fund uh, or receive funds for family planning that permitted involuntary non-consensual sterilizations. And as I recall, we won about half of that case. Um, we were trying to eliminate all involuntary sterilizations. Um, and we, we didn't get that. We did get, however, uh, the due process hearing. So there was, you know, there was some progress made, at least before somebody could be sterilized. If they were a welfare recipient, they, had, they were entitled to, uh, to some, some level of due process. Since then, those there's no funding for involuntary sterilization. That came in another generation of lawsuits. Um, another area of, I suppose I would call it civil rights slash welfare work, although by the time I got involved, the concept of civil rights had broadened to include constituencies other than blacks and issues other than uh, discrimination and integration. So this other, as part of my work at the Center for Law and Social Policy, uh, we also worked on uh, trying to provide more effective treatment for involuntarily civilly committed persons. Uh, part, of, part of that litigation was trying to make sure that the institutions which housed civilly committed persons uh, were up to what we would call constitutional muster, were not just warehouses. And also we worked on what was then called a right to treatment and the least restrictive alternative so that persons could not just be dumped in these warehouse facilities for their lives with no treatment and no, no due process review of their progress or any attempts to get them uh, housed where they could be more self-sufficient people. Um, these were test tube cases. They were legal experiments. They were sometimes more successful in law than they were in practice. Uh, but that was, I spent one summer in a mental institution in Alabama uh, trying, you know, just studying it, really. Uh, it, was, it was fascinating. It was, it was really very fascinating about the frame of mind of everybody involved there. Another place where I did health law was on the Navajo Reservation for a legal aid group called Denebeina Nihilde Be'egarete'e that uh, 
meant at the time, and I always thought it was a misnomer, uh, lawyers who work for the economic revitalization of the people. But actually, their charter was very limited. The last thing they could ever work for was the economic revitalization of anybody, <laughs> because we were always forewarned that were we to become outside agitators or politicize any of uh, our legal representation of the Navajos, we would be ousted from the reservation and that indeed happened with some frequency. Um, the work that I did on the reservation also involved health care. It involved primar well, two, two areas of health care. One was trying to open up access for Navajos to off-reservation hospitals that refused to provide emergency room services because the Navajos had Bureau of Indian Affairs clinics uh, that were reserved basically to tribal members. And so since the Anglos couldn't go to those, receive those services, they were excluding the Navajos from their services. But at the time, there was a statute called the Hill-Burton Act, which required any hospital that received federal funding to provide a certain level of for free care for indigents. So that was a law reform case that was litigated. In fact, those, law ref those Hill Burton cases were litigated on the reservation, off the reservation, all over the country in a number of contexts. Um, another uh, area of health care that I worked on in the reservation was just to bring more health care facilities to the reservation. Um, that was really interesting because it sort of got into the anthropological conflicts between Anglo medical, uh, Anglo medicine and Navajo medicine. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if, if your child's having a seizure or is bleeding to death or there's been a car accident, there does have to be some immediate medical care provided before the backup services that the tribe would use uh, could be called into action. And there were, there were almost no clinics. Maybe there, were, there was one. And the reason there were no clinics is there were no roads. Everybody got around on horseback, but if somebody's injured, you can't get around on horseback very well. And if you don't have a pickup truck, and some people had pickups, but not everybody did. So there was just a lot of work done to try to get foundations to, uh, and this was clearly political work, uh, to fund clinics on the reservation. One of the interesting health care issues that I dealt with which just sort of went against the grain of everything else I had dealt with, is that there was a Navajo man who had been admitted into the emergency room of a Gallup hospital uh, where he died and where his body was autopsied. And he was treated just like any Anglo would have been treated under those circumstances. And his family was just absolutely appalled that his body would have been autopsied because it violated uh, many of their, their religious beliefs on how somebody could progress into the afterlife. And so we actually brought a lawsuit that was completely contrary to all the other lawsuits <laughs> we were bringing that said, how dare you admit this guy <laughs> and autopsy him? And, and we did win that one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, I guess, you know, the main thing, the main difference between the world of civil rights work that I was involved in versus my colleagues is that, you know, they were basically outlaws and anarchists and outside agitators. <laughs> and I shouldn't be at the same table with them. But I, you know, by, the, <laughs> by the time it evolved, you know, I, bought, you know. I wore a tie every day. <laughs> so did I. <laughs> so did I. The next generation um, had the benefit of, of their, their work. I mean, now uh, civil rights work had been institutionalized we could work from the inside. And that's pretty much what I was able to do. I, I got into it through my law school, which had institutionalized programs that had contacts with uh, uh, se uh, public interest law firms. And you know, every, it, it had become part of the norm 
rather than what the anarchists engaged in during the summers. And I think, you know, that, that says a lot about how things changed in the country. I suppose the most important thing that I learned from these experiences uh, was how incredibly powerful our judicial system can be as an engineer of social change. Uh, so unlike judicial systems anywhere else in the world, and how powerful the effort of a few can be to affect the well-being of many. Um, it, was, it was a very, very interesting time. I never felt particularly powerful, but I certainly could appreciate uh, the collective efforts of hundreds and thousands of people who really believed that they were their brother's keeper, that they were responsible for the well-being of other people, and who committed their life's work to doing just that. Are there any questions or comments that any of you might have? Or any additional comments any one up here would have? Yes, I want you all to know I'm withdrawing from this conspiracy as I <laughs> sit here. While at the same time, uh, having gotten some religion along the way from, from the likes of Daniel Berrigan and, and that crowd, Jesus, Jesus, et cetera, um, I was on the board of a, a legal aid group, volunteer group, that operated out of the Green Green during those same years. And listening to you guys, I guess I truly think, I mean, I can't believe I was that oblivious, but I truly believe that until 70-ish, I was oblivious to the reality that you described. And since I know you learned it from the newspapers and from public sources, um, it, it, it's hard in retrospect to comprehend how out of it one could be. Um, and at the same time, not so far out of it that I didn't know there was something to be done about the Cabrini Green stuff. Um, and, and I guess I tell the story in part, again, by, by way of confession, but also in part to suggest that the dynamics of, of social change and the role of the law is, is, is much more, frankly, Diane, I think, much more complicated and, and reliant on, on public opinion than, than might otherwise be believed until it becomes a norm, until there's a transformation of social consciousness. I suspect that only the likes of you guys, who are somehow tapped into a different network of information than, than the vast majority of people were at the time, you can only. It's the difference between Notre Dame and St. John's. No, 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 I was a Brooklyn college. <laughs> 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 We have subsequently made friends with, with folks who were in all of the places you described. <coughs> but anyway, I, I do think that, that uh, the, uh, the dynamics of social change are, are uh, pretty darn complicated, and, and there are limits to the ability of the law and, and for individuals to do things. I think Bill's link to the grassroots is the context within which Craig and then subsequently Diane's generation, so to speak, not that you're that much different, but um, can succeed. That until the judges understand it from a perspective of politics and policy, it, it doesn't happen. It's my own sense. Yeah. <clears throat> Apropos of that, maybe a little story. Um, years passed, and um, I was in Germany. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, at a meeting of the International Bar Association uh, discussing the um, representation of, um, of terrorists, or, or of those who were charged with being terrorists, rather, and the international scene and the proper defense that should be uh, allocated to them, you know, vis-a-vis -vis what uh, the present situation. But anyhow, the, um, uh, at, at that meeting, there was one young lady who was uh, defending someone who was, I can't even recall who it was right now, but uh, someone who was very much in the news as being identified as being one of um, the more wicked of the terrorists. And um, she was, um, uh, she wasn't arguing that he was a terrorist, but she was arguing that the procedures that had to be observed and so on. There was a discussion as to what, what ought to be the position of the International Law Association with regard to, or society with regard to that uh, issue. And um, she was sitting uh, nearby me uh, when she was speaking, and um, she looked at me, and then uh, she came over and she asked to, uh, if I was who she thought I was, and I identified myself. And she said, you know, she said, back in 1965, uh, when uh, you got all these, my classmates and so on, to, uh, she was from a, one of the finishing schools, one of the better finishing schools in Pennsylvania, and she said, I thought all of you people were a bunch of radicals and crazy and out of your minds and so on. And you weren't going to achieve anything and so on. And so I really hated you and hated especially uh, because a lot of my classmates looked down upon me because I was, you know, not uh, in the same frame of mind. And she says, but now look at me. She says, that experience, now I, just, I feel that I was wrong, you know, and uh, and now here I am, you know, defending someone whom the whole world says ought not to have anybody representing them at all. You know, so um, this this gradual raising of consciousness, I guess we all can make some small contribution to that, and gradually. And I strongly uh, agree with your your position that I think the law follows public opinion rather than. Although I should, there's an interaction of the two, and that's been much debated. But I think. Um, uh, a lot of actions uh, sometimes have to be taken in, in defiance of the law in order to point out sometimes the, the error of the law. But you also have to accept the consequences of it, by the way. My um, sort of final thoughts on reflecting on what our colleagues have uh, talked about, uh, one thing is to my mind, the importance of the federal judiciary. Uh, and I, I think Mike emphasized that as especially. Um, when we were in Mississippi, we tried very hard, and, and we were successful almost all the time, to get these cases into the federal judiciary where there is true independence, typically, uh, especially at the appeals court level. And to have a judiciary that's very well trained, very independent, fierily so, very talented, uh, and caring about the Constitution is a huge uh, advantage. And then uh, secondly, the organized bar uh, was very involved in, from about 1962 through the present day, uh, th with money, organization, uh, encouragement, volunteerism, and so forth. Yeah, I, w I would uh, second that. My Cairo article talks a lot about the role of the federal judiciary. To I guess it's, having lived through these experiences, it's hard for me to, when I listen to some of the judges on the Supreme Court and stuff talk about the role of the courts, uh, uh, sort of understand where they're coming from or wondering why they didn't uh, 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 live life a little differently. Uh, the other thing, from my perspective, I think that uh, I had never experienced before and, and only a couple times when I've been overseas maybe uh, had this uh, somewhat similar feeling, is the feeling of being someplace and realizing that there's no law there. That, uh, you know, somebody could kill you or do what they wanted to do, and for <clears throat> all practical pur purposes, um, despite of having somebody in the Fifth Circuit and all of that type of thing, uh, we know the history of what happened down there, that people were constantly acquitted. And I don't, you know, just for a few months to live under that situation, I was totally and still am today in awe of people who can live and try to live a normal life when you know that you're sort of at the mercy of other people and there really isn't a, 
a rule of law there that's uh, there to protect you. And, and that's uh, to me, was a very, very scary thing. Do, do you recall the pickup trucks with the rifles through do the I? rear windows? <laughs> yeah. you, you, every, every day and every night, uh, many, many, many typically white pickup trucks with rifles and shotguns showing through the rear windows for the purpose of intimidation, driving around, seeing what's happening. That was very scary. Well, what they would frequently do is bend up their license plates, too, so you couldn't follow their license plate. Yeah. Right. 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 Thank you. Keep your, keep your notes.